This is our 26th lesson in Ephesians. And we are in a very, uh, very challenging section of the book. I'm particularly aware of the criticality of it. It's compounded by the fact that for many years I was taught wrongly about this passage. I deeply regret that. But he has given me to see it more clearly, so we'll pass it along to you. Now, from a, a moral and spiritual viewpoint, moral meaning the ability to determine right and wrong and answer appropriately, and spiritual having to do with awareness of God, from those two viewpoints, the, the entire human race were dead in trespasses and sins and alienated from God. And there was no difference. All had sinned and come short of the glory of God. However, culturally and positionally, men were divided <clears throat> by location and language. This didn't not touch on the spiritual part, you understand, but it, it's going to be involved in working out a solution. And this scattered state resulted from God dispersing the people at beginning at Shinar. But there's a strategy behind it. Everyone was positioned in time and location so they could seek the Lord and feel after. All you could do really is feel after him. There wasn't, there wasn't any, for a long time there wasn't any revelation of any sort. And then there was just a isolated body of people that got the revelation. So really, that's a good word, feel. The people sensed there was a God, but they just kind of groped like a blind man. God intended for that. I got to find out, people don't find out how important God is until they do some groping. Yeah. Try and find him. Sometimes during crises, people begin groping. Amen. Now, this division, of course, was by determination, divine determination, as I've said. He divided the people, their lots, according to the number of the children of Israel, Moses said. And Paul said that he placed them there so he might seek after the Lord. However, there is a greater division than this that developed among the people. One viewpoint is a level playing field. From another is dispersed with all different kind of locations and times. But from another, beginning with Abraham, there were only two groups of people. The Jews and the Gentiles, that's the beginning with Abraham, that, that began to be developed. Two groups. One heard from God, one did not. God revealed himself to one people, he didn't to the other people. One were a people God recognized, another were people God didn't recognize. One group was preferred, the other group was not. One group received, others did not. Later in time, one group received first and others later. Now, this was not intended to be a, a permanent division, but it was a necessary prelude to salvation. God was going to teach men what salvation was and what it required and what it necessitated. 
Now, the church at large has not done well in presenting this to the people. They've oversimplified salvation, so much so that people don't think anything about it. When you say salvation, it doesn't like stir a bunch of praises. It's, it just isn't that sort of thing. It doesn't, it doesn't charge people up to hear about salvation because they really, quite frankly, I'm talking about the most educated and most church people. They do not know what it means to be saved. So God's going to use this scenario, Jew and Gentile, to teach. Because there's no person on earth, there's no angel, there's no cherub that had the faintest idea how powerful God's grace, mercy, and kindness really was. Amen. They knew very, 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 very little of these traits. Kindness, mercy, and grace. Salvation is a phenomenal exhibit of them all. And so to do it, he's going to he's going to he's going to be found of some people that sought him. And then he's going to be found of some people that didn't seek him. <laughs> this circumstance substantially demonstrates that salvation is not of works. Now, what I, if salvation was of works, then what I'm going to teach you tonight has to be done by men. Mm -hmm. no. This is salvation is what we're talking about. Yeah. So if what we're going to read about tonight, if salvation is by works, forget about God doing this that we're going to read tonight. Men got to do it. Yeah, Paul put it this way, speaking of what men would be required to do, if you're saved by works. He'd have to go up into heaven, is Romans 10, bring Jesus down. Then after Jesus died, he'd have to go down into the grave, bring him out, and take him back to heaven. If man can't do that, man can't be saved by works, because that's, <laughs> that's such a work that had to be done. So technically, men are saved by works, but they're, they're God's works, and particularly Christ's works. Now, the people to whom God didn't reveal himself were, were referred to as heathen. And the Lord told Israel, don't learn the way of the heathen. They're going to cross paths with you. You'll be in Canaan there, but the heathen's going to be passing through there, and you'll be doing some commercial work with them. Don't learn the way of the heathen. But they didn't pay, pay any attention to that. So he's going to, he's going to show us salvation can't even retrieve a person from that state. You see, <laughs> all these states scattered, different languages, different locations, different accepted, not accepted. People backslid, people learned the way of the world. So he's expounding this text, he's expounding this fact in his text, which is verses 15 and 16 of the second chapter having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. All right, now this is... Uh, this is a difficult passage to explain. Of course, that's another way of saying it. it's hard to see. <laughs> you can explain something you understand pretty well, but I'm going to do my best. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Now, I remember our previous verse told us he took two people, he took Jew and Gentile, made one people out of them, one new people. How did he do that? That's what we're going to see tonight. <clears throat> now, the accomplishment of this, Jew and Gentile coming one body, is heralded as one of the greatest works God has ever done. Paul said, this is a mystery. I'm going to tell the mystery how that Gentiles are fellow heirs with Jews. This is one of the greatest things God ever did. 
and yet it's hardly talked about in the modern church. Hardly talked about it at all. In fact, a great decided number of the church says it just doesn't involve the Jews at all. But here Paul says this, it's a great mystery that God revealed to me how that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. See? So this is, uh, this is quite a work. We are beholding. We're going to see how he did how he did this. The wisdom that was necessary to do this, to make these two groups, one, this far transcends anything man can conceive. It can only be appreciated by faith. That's the only way. Keep in mind now that the condition that God's resolving is one he made himself. That's got to be a difficult situation. <laughs> well, what if God asked you to resolve a problem he made? You just have to say, thou art God, you know, <laughs> who is equal to such a thing as this. But this is what we're dealing with here. The point is being developed Again, I want to continue to make this is that man's not saved by works. That's the point that he's developing. The man is saved by grace through faith. That's the point he's developing. That it's not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. That's what he's developing. So he uses this phrase having abolished, it's a strong word, isn't it? Yeah. Having abolished in his flesh. It's a strong phrase. Other versions say put an end to, destroyed, did away with, nullified, made void, ended, abrogated, done away, cleared away, ended, canceled, set aside, destroyed, caused to cease. And repeal. See, it's a big. <laughs> this is something that came out of his mouth. This and he created. Now, two uh, two points are critical here. First, something was. There is something you're going to confront that has been abolished. Ended, terminated, annulled, done away when Jesus died on the cross. And second, it was abolished or terminated in his flesh. Yeah, amen. <laughs> when Jesus bore the sins of humanity in his own body on the tree. Now, the thing that was abolished was taken out of the way, as he was, it was in the way. It had to be removed before these two people could become one. This, this had to be addressed, this wall that yeah. was between them. And here's how he identifies it here. The law of commandments contained in ordinances. Yeah, that's, that's a very precise, very precise verse. I want to work on this a little bit. Other versions say the law with its commandments and regulations. The law with its rules and orders. The Jewish Bible says the Torah with its commands set forth in a form of ordinances. Notice that all these verses are so far it says with. That's not what the text said. Either in the original or in the English. The law of commandments which standeth in ordinances. That's pretty good. The system of law with its commandments and regulations. The law of commandments with its decrees. The law of commandments contained in the law written. We'd say the, the written law. The law of Moses with all its rules and commands. It's New Century Bible. Ended the law with its many commands and rules. That's the English Revised Version. 
repeal the law code that had become so clogged with fine print and footnotes that it hindered more than it helped. That's the message. Now, anyone that tries it, it won't do any good to try and convince me that a variety of versions have helped people. Yeah. So if anyone wants to make a case for that, you're wasting your time on me. And quite frankly, I think I could bury you on it anyway. It's simply not the truth. It should, you, we should see this. Every time I go through some of these versions for you, you should see that it has, it has confused the whole matter. Right. Now the question is, what was abolished? The law of commandments contained in ordinances. Now, although it's very, it is very carefully crafted, you can tell by reading it, it's a very carefully crafted, but it's shot over the heads of, of the people, notwithstanding. Colossians states the same truth in this way, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. See? Hand, handwriting, both of them, handwriting of ordinances that was against us. The literal translation of the Ephesian text is the law of the directions in decrees. The word ordinances means doctrine, decrees, rules, and requirements. Now the Ten Commandments weren't doctrine. They weren't rules. They weren't requirements. So what, that there wasn't something you tried to do. They were commandments. They just they had no leeway at all. That's the way they were. So this text does not refer to the Ten Commandments. Something I was taught for years that, that it did. It refers to what is commonly called the ceremonial law. What's the ceremonial law? It's the Levitical law. It's in the book of Leviticus. God just didn't like give the people the Ten Commandments and say obey these. He spelled out how they were to obey it. If he said keep the Sabbath day, he told them step by step what to do. The laws of clean and unclean, that was part of the ceremonial law. Land Sabbath, part of the ceremonial law. The high priesthood of the tabernacle service, that was the ceremonial law. This, this wasn't the Ten Commandments, this is what... The, this was a system God set up to force people, if it was possible, to do what the Ten Commandments said. Contained in ordinances. How are you going to determine whether a person kept the Ten Commandments or not? That's right. yeah. How did they handle the ordinances? Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. That tells you how they handled the ordinances were the how-to uh -huh. yeah. of the law. And that's what he's talking about now in our text. He abolished the uh, ordinances. For example, if, if the people did not honor the weekly Sabbath, they broke the covenant. If they didn't honor the land Sabbaths, every seventh year let the land lie, they, they broke the covenant. It was the, in the ordinance, that's... That was the how-to portion. That's the part that substantiated that you were right or proved you were wrong. How you respond. If he said three feasts a year you observe, <laughs> that is exactly what he meant. And you better not take your vacation during one of those feasts. If he said make tabernacles and camp outside for a week, that's what you had to do. If he said, get all the yeast out of the house, that's what you had to do. Well, there'd be a mass rebellion if something like that was acquired today. There'd be mass rebellion. But I insist that if a person could not today live under that system, he couldn't live under Christ. I'm telling you the truth now. If you can't take orders from God... You just as well forget about being saved. Right. It's not going to happen. 
There were some Jews who couldn't keep these and were concerned about it. You'd read about it in the prayers of David. Quite frequently, he'd bring this up. There were people, see, who saw, oh, I'm coming short of this. Whenever there was some kind of renewal, they confessed, they come short. And every time they had come short in the ordinances, the commandments contained in ordinances. The literal words of the law were contained in stone. The meaning of the law was contained in ordinances, which were written by Moses. God wrote the law on tables of stone. Moses wrote it in a book. Now the way it stated in Exodus thirty-four twenty-eight, he wrote the law on the tables. As some people believe it was Moses that wrote the law, but this case, Moses rehearses this event. So I want to read what Moses said about it in Deuteronomy ten, one. At that time, the Lord said unto me, "Hew the two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me in the mount, and make thee an ark of gopher wood. <clears throat> I make thee an ark of wood, and I will write upon the tables of the words tables." the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. And I made an ark of shittim wood, and hewed two tables of stone, like unto the first, and went up unto the mount, having the two tables in mine hand, and he wrote on the tables. So see, I clarify, that God wrote on both those tables, ones that Moses broke, and the other later ones too. But they, the, Israel did not have access to those tables. So when he gave the ordinances, he said, write it in a book for the people. That was all of the, we would say the implications or the application or the how-to or what. That's what the ordinance, that's what they were. Because nobody had any idea, like, how do you, how do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and soul? There are still people that, how do you do this? You do this by obeying what he says. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Yes. So the law that told people how to do this. How do you love your neighbor as yourself? Don't be moving his landmark. Don't be walking through his field and eating his goods. Don't let your animal stray over in his territory. See, he spelled it out, the ordinances. And these men, men were accepted or not accepted by God on the basis of these ordinances. One of the chief parts of the ceremonial law, of course, was the high priesthood, which went by the wayside. Over the years, it kind of went away, and finally some people had to restore it. So they... The ordinances is, is what was abolished, the how-to part. Why? Because in Christ, the how-to's yeah. <coughs> inside. It's not outside. We are taught by God. Yeah. Not it through or Israel was taught by God too, but it was through ordinances. Yeah. Through ordinances. We're not taught through ordinances. We're taught by God. We're taught by Christ. Yeah. Ephesians 4.20 says, The law is written on our heart, which means we're inclined yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. toward it. So when Jesus died, that wasn't the end of the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. That's right. Here's how I was taught it. It's still taught this way today. and Some people will get a fierce argument. That when Christ died, he eradicated, obliterated, totally removed Genesis through, Revela uh, Genesis through Malachi. Some people, they balk a little bit and say, well, no, it, just, it was just the Mosaic law, including the Ten Commandments. Then what God did, he restated the commandments that he wanted to carry on. Of course, the reason they did that is because he couldn't handle the Sabbath commandment. That was like a <laughs> bottleneck. Yeah. They didn't realize that there's another kind of Sabbath that replaced. Yeah. Yeah. The Sabbath day was not superseded by a commandment concerning the Lord's day. The Sabbath day was superseded by a more glorious rest. Yeah. And Hebrews 4, of course, Amen. 
teaches that. That's what the whole fourth chapter of Hebrews yeah. is about. So this ordinance says the law required absolute consistency. You were not allowed mm -hmm. to drop the ball on any of this how-to. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do it. Now the law was ended as a means to righteousness. That's, right. That's categorically stated in Hebrews 10.4. Mm -hmm. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Mm -hmm. Remember, and the law was worked out by keeping the ordinances. People were told precisely how to live, what to eat, who to befriend, how to serve God. Nothing was left up to the individual. Nothing, absolutely nothing was left up to the individual. How you sew your clothes, how you plant your fields, everything was spelled out. This is called the handwriting of ordinances in Colossians. As I mentioned, this was not in reference to God's writing, but to Moses' writing. So during that period, 40-day period, he was up there. He just wasn't like gasping at the glory of God. He got the full layout of the tabernacle. Yeah. And he got all these ordinances revealed to him. Everything about the high priesthood was revealed to him. All that was revealed to him. Everything you read in Leviticus, it was revealed during those 40 days. He's with God up on the mountain. So it, boy, this is a business packed with. Amen. You'd be hard pressed to learn those things in 40 days now. Yeah. You'd be hard pressed. Yeah. The mass of material that was revealed in, plus all the history of the world, like from Genesis, you know, all revealed. To Moses, all right, now, why did God do this? <laughs> because these ordinances, which was the law contained in ordinances, commandments contained in ordinances, were like a barrier. It distinguished Israel from all other people. That's right. yeah. mm -hmm. It was a barrier. They had something nobody else had, and it was a middle wall of partition. Yeah. Nobody could crawl over it. Nobody could dig under it. Nobody could go through it. It separated the people. You weren't Israel. You were heathen. Mm -hmm. Gentile to do not God. And God has already, God had planned, we know now, God had planned to make everything one in heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Total unity. Well, to do this, we've got to get rid of whatever divides. And so that's why he took this wall down. If you're going to make these people one, you've got to get rid of the distinction between them, which actually was, a, was an outward distinction because these ordinances all had to do with how you live, with outward type of expressions. So he did this to make it himself of twain or two, one new man. Now this, so the knowledge of this, when they dawned upon the apostles some years after Jesus went back to heaven, they were moved to write a letter to the Gentile churches about some of these ordinances. One, one ordinance was circumcision. That was one of the ordinances. To write to them and tell them what they were not obligated to do. You're not obligated to keep circumcision. You're, you, you should not eat meat offered to blood. Don't eat meat offered to sacrifice to idols. Abstain from fornication. You You'll do well if you do these things. So they freed the Gentile churches from this how-to. That, that has now been restored. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Except it's lower down than the other. Yeah, yeah. Now the how-to is man's ordinances. Yeah. They're trying to do what God showed you can't be done with a divine ordinance that can't be done. Yeah. And men are cooking up these plans. And teaching people how to do this and how to do this. It's dead wrong. Amen. You can't put the new covenant in ordinances Amen. like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, it has often been said the only two ordinances the church has is baptism and the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. There's something about that that I'm not altogether comfortable with that language myself, but that's... 
That's something God has spelled out what you do and when you do it and this sort of thing. To make it himself of twain to one new man. Now this in himself to make in himself. <laughs> that is the is, this is realized when the people get into Christ, then the one takes place Amen. in Christ. It's not outside of Christ. We're not trying to negotiate a union externally between the Baptists and the Methodists. Or the Christian church and the Church of Christ. This is all wasted. It may look like it's wise, but it's dumb. You can't unite the people of God on that basis. It's in Christ. Because Christ is one. You join him, you become one spirit with Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. So the Jews and Gentiles are in him, that are in him, are in fact one new man. Now this is the only place in scripture this phrase is used like this. But this is different now than norm we're accustomed to it being used. Other versions say one new humanity. Or a single new humanity. Living Bible, as is characteristic of it, says one new person. <laughs> I mean, there's no excuse for a blunder like that. One new people, all right, that's, that's on target. Here's the message Bible, a new kind of human being. The purpose is, the accent is not on the individual. Now that you're in Christ, you are a new creation. That's, that's individual. This new man, this is not individual. This is a new lineage, a new progeny, a new body of people. That don't, they're neither Jew nor Gentile, neither one. They've been joined together into one. This had to be done. See, Jesus himself is called the second man and the last Adam. He, there's only two people that have had a race of people that came, all of them came from him. Adam's one, Christ is the other. Now by saying they become one new man, the accent is they have, the sa they have a sameness of nature Amen. as mankind versus beasts, mankind versus birds. Yeah. See, mankind versus fish. That's what we're talking about. Have a, those in Christ all have the same nature. And the reason they do is because the distinction between them that God raised up, God took down. So one could cross over to the... The Gentiles didn't cross over. The Jews didn't cross over to the, to the Gentiles. The Gentiles crossed over to the Jews. Well, if that's true, then the Jews can't be extinct. That's right. If the body's made up of Jew and Gentile, how could it be that in 70 AD the Jews were cut off? We have to have a Gentile body? No. It's still Jew and Gentile. Even though in Christ they're not Jew and Gentile. He tell you where they came from. There'll never come a point in time ever when the body is not comprised of former Jews and Gentiles. Amen. Out of the two, he made one. Yeah. Even though a God-ordained distinction existed and God took it down, men built another one. Yeah. He built another wall. Because we are the, <coughs> some people, we are the Reformation movement. Oh, yeah. huh? We are the, Restoration movement. Huh? Yeah. These are walls now, brethren. Right, These are the same. We are the holiness mm -hmm. movement. We are the Azuzu <laughs> movement. And on and on you go. Ad infinitum. Building up distinction so that you're, if you're not on this side of the wall, you're not accepted. Yeah. If you're on that side of the wall, you're not accepted. See? But the, God, the wall, the only wall that ever existed in humanity has been taken down. 
one new man. There's only been one people who were distinct because of appearance. As I emphasize it again. There's only been one people that are distinct because of appearance. He was a Jew. He had a unique set of ordinances. None of their holidays were the same as the world. Their ceremonies were not like that of the world. Their covenant was different. The sign of the covenant was different. The high priesthood was different. Sacrifices weren't the same. Their high days, like the Day of Atonement, weren't the same. Their definition of clean and unclean weren't the same. See, these are the commandments contained in ordinances. They, that's what made them distinct. It wasn't that they were morally more pure because a lot of the time they were just as bad and sometimes worse than the rest of the people. It wasn't because they had a king because other nations had kings. It was the ordinances. That's where they were unique. Yeah. All, all these walls that, that shoot up, um, they... they they actually indicate that God changes. Like as opposed to, Scripture said God never changes. Now yeah. it says he's going to do a new thing, but that was through Christ Jesus. That's right. And it's not, it's not constantly through the ages. Oh, he's doing something new here. Oh, he's doing something new here. Yeah. Yeah. He's not You're doing right. that. You're he, right. did, he did one new thing through Christ Jesus. That's right. That's right. He, the new creation is in Christ. So that's absolutely right, and it does. It does suggest a change in God. People say, this is what God's doing today. It sounds so holy. Oh, it does, yeah. But Little Matt. What I was having as we were going through here is that the, the people talk about this abolishing as if as if God's doing something new now in the new covenant. He's, he's doing, a, a, like, plan B, you know. Yeah. The law, it, 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 for its intended purpose, it didn't pan out, so now we have to have plan B. They don't see it as a continuation. They don't see the congruity of his purpose, of his word. Amen. And we will admit that if a person gets into the flow of what God's doing, it will, it will be new. In that case, it's new. But it's because it's not of the flesh. One new man. Now the general, in general, the traits of the new man are, he, like Jesus, he loves righteousness, he loves righteousness and hates iniquity. That's the general kind of the composite view. In particular, he found in the Christ distributing the spiritual gifts which are facets of his nature that through them the people might minister to his people. That's the thing that makes them unique. If a body of people are not ministering to one another, they cannot substantiate that they're even in Christ. Yeah, that's right. now, we're not saying they aren't. I'm very careful to say this is not saying they aren't. We're talking about evidence of substantiation. The evidence is when they love righteousness and hate iniquity, and when they're using what God has given them to minister to his people, that's the evidence that they're in Christ. That's verse, see, that's a lot different than commandments contained in ordinances. Because it's dealing more with nature than with habit. There's a sense in which there's only one new man, and we all become new as we abide in that, in that man, that one accepted man, which is Christ. Well, yeah, yeah. He's called the man, Christ Jesus, yeah. Yeah. And I'm saying the way, the, the way, see, the, God be careful not to neutralize the meaning of words by spreading them out too thin. It's used two ways in Scripture. Christ is the man. Not the, not, he's not the new man. He, there's a reason why. It's because the people that are in him are the new man. And, and, and the people, we're individually new, but collectively we're new. And that's the thing Paul's talking about, this collective new, which is in Christ, which is for you. There's only oneness in Christ. 
This would say the same thing you just said. You were just saying. <clears throat> Uh, about how many men have spent their life trying to get unity between two particular oh, yeah. groups. Mm -hmm. But in Christ, when God's already done this, mm -hmm. I mean, if you profess Christ, mm -hmm. being in Christ, you profess mm -hmm. to be in Christ and there's not oneness there, mm -hmm. then you need to be preaching. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, they need to be, they need a good dose of the gospel or, yeah. you know, or in, something. And John, see, he addressed it by talking about the love of the brethren. Mm -hmm. he, that's how he approached, the, approached it from that viewpoint. Loving the brethren. Made them both one, new, new, new man, new, new race, yeah. so making peace. So what makes peace? Oneness makes for peace. <laughs> when you're one with God, you have peace with God. See? If you're one with each other, one mind, you have peace. Agitation is the offshoot of division. Yeah. That's what it is. Wherever there's agitation, there's division somewhere. It's agitating the waters. So what God did, he recreated a new race in Christ. Think of all the factions that are developing the Jews. By the time Christ is here, we have Pharisees, Sadducees, lawyers, Scribes, with the exception of the scribe, which was used in a little different way, none of these were under the law. These were not offices mm -hmm. that the law instituted. These were things man instituted. Yeah, that's right. mm -hmm. It was in a mess when Jesus got here. Mm -hmm. it was, there was no peace. Warring factions, like there is today, unfortunately. Now, the peace of reverence is not peace with God. So making peace. Mm -hmm. Jesus did make peace with God. It's Colossians 127. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about peace with one another. Mm -hmm. Now every place people are called upon to compromise, there's a lack of peace. Right. Yeah. That's why they call to compromise. You don't people in Christ don't have to compromise anything. If you're in Christ, you can be at peace and you can accept a brother who may be at a little lower level, or you will honor one maybe at a little higher level, but there's peace. There's peace. Paul could talk to Onesimus or he could talk to Peter. He was at peace. See? After 1,500 years, now to assume what a great work this was, there had been hostility between Jews and Gentiles for. 1,500 years since the giving of the law. For 1,500 years, there had been hostility between the Jews and Gentiles. And now, not, not through a period of time, not through a series of words and lectures, but in one act on the cross, yeah. in his flesh, by his blood, mm -hmm. the hostility was removed. Yeah. And immediately, mm -hmm. they were all of one mind. It's spelled out for you in Acts there. Acts 2 and Acts 4, it spells it out. The people are all of one heart. What happened? Middle wall was down. They knew it was down. They were in Christ. And the things in Christ are so good. Who wants to return to ordinances when you're taught by the Spirit? God didn't come in any negotiations between <laughs> Jews and Gentiles to bring them together. Let's kind of talk through this thing. Because that compromise you're talking about is the result of a variance in nature. That's right. That's what that's what makes them at one another. So they have to compromise, but it doesn't really change them. That's it's right. not a lasting peace. Mm -hmm. So what he did is he actually changed the nature of both and made them one. Made them one. Who were as different as different could be. When it comes to men, they were Jew and Gentile were as different as different could be. So it wasn't enough just to convert different kinds of Jews. That wasn't big enough, see, to demonstrate the power of his mercy, kindness, and grace. That wasn't big enough to demonstrate that. To take two different kind of cultures that were cult for years, cultured different ways, thought different ways, acted different ways, to make them one. <laughs> now, brethren, I tell you, that's doing something. But to do it, you got to get rid of this, this religious wall. 
the commandments contained in ordinances. Brother Aaron. Well, the Lord built this wall, so it seems reasonable that he'd be the only one that could take it That's down. That's right. Mm -hmm. You can see, if all of you can see, can't you, that the reason he built the wall was so he could demonstrate the magnitude of his salvation by saving people from both mm -hmm. both sides of the wall. Go ahead. It's not uh, brought out very, not, I don't, have never heard the point emphasized in that early part of Acts when the, uh, the, the brethren, where it's in those early chapters where the point is made how the early brethren behaved with one another, the fellowship they had, right. had all things common. Yeah. And what's stressed there mostly is the enthusiasm, the energy of the spirit that they had. Which, and, that's, and it's true, but really the point to see is how that Jew and Gentile were able to this could exist or be possible between the Jew and Gentile. That's right. That's never made, uh, never brought out like so that. As soon as Cor that's, Peter that's saw this word. with Cornelius, there was a, mm -hmm. there was a bonding with right, right, right there, right there it happened. Church at Antioch, mm -hmm. Gentile church, apostles came down and well, they said, "Whoa, this is a genuine thing." They joined in the prophets from Jerusalem. They could go down and prophesy at Antioch. There's a couple of prophets went down there. The prophets from Jerusalem, Jewish prophets, could go down and prophesy in the Gentile churches. There wasn't any difficulty with that at all because they had one mind, see. Yeah. Yeah. One mind. All right, it was necessary to bring an end to the law as a means to righteousness to bring, make the people into one body. By the cross. <laughs> but that's where it happened. It didn't happen, as Brother Ricky said, it didn't happen at the negotiating table. That's, it happened at the cross. It, it judicially happened at the cross. That is, it, that was where the, this is clumsy language, that where the contract was struck there, and now the unity could be accomplished because there was a foundation for it wrought out at the cross. The cross cleared away any obstacle to unity. That happened when Jesus died. So it's not enough to tell people Jesus loved you and died for you. Jesus' death accomplished a unity that if you're going to go to heaven, you've got to be united with the people of God. So shall we, we, not me or I, so shall we ever be with the Lord. The cross accomplished what was needed to bring these people into one. One grand act. Now once the law was, once sin was taken away, the entire system of ordinances as divine by the law is abolished. Because now people want to do the will of God. So that does away with the requirement for ordinances as the law had. Even with the commandment to keep the Sabbath, they eventually stopped. Mm -hmm. The high priesthood eventually stopped. When he writes his laws upon your heart, you have this compelling desire. I love, I love. You know, you, you have this compelling desire that won't let you ignore what God says. All right, that changes the need for ordinances. Hit me again. How unless you're born again, you can't do this. No. I mean, you're not compelled. So if someone doesn't do it, do the things of God. They're they're not born again. They're not compelled to do these That's things. Exactly they're right. not able. And and Jermaine to our text here, nobody could be born again until this matter of division was resolved. See, it, the point had to come where anybody and everybody could come in. As long as that wall was there, it couldn't. And as long as sin was not judged, the wall stayed. Amen. Did you see that? As soon as sin was done away, the law was not made for a righteous man. Yeah. That's what the scripture says. Uh -huh. It was made for the sinful man. Yeah. When you resolve the matter of sin, mm -hmm. you resolve the need for law. Moral law we're talking about. Yeah. So Christ is the end of the law for everyone who's been made righteous. 
This text in 1 Timothy 1 9 states the truth about the law is not made, it is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. That's the kind of people law are for. So if a person has to have law to keep them straight, <laughs> that's the category they're in. So Christ made it into the law for righteousness, having slain, I think how strong this is, having slain the enmity or the hostility or division. The Amplified Bible says, killing the mutual enmity and bringing the hatred to an end. Now law, when it's used as a means to salvation, foments and causes hatred. There's nobody that hates as much as a sectarian. If you've ever been caught up, if you've ever been caught up in sectarianism, you notice. Bitter hatred, rivalry, and this sort of thing. It's the em that was the enmity. The enmity, the thing that caused the trouble was the law said you're in trouble with God. What people didn't realize is that created a horizontal trouble. So he slew the enmity, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and then uh, because the people now are constrained from within, there is a higher law. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Well, you can see something of the magnitude of salvation. The bottom line to this is not of works. If it's of works, then men have to bring Jew and Gentile together. That's, they have to, that, that has to be done. Those two bands, two masses of people. And if they destroy the enmity, they can't be hostile toward each other. So God devised this great salvation that takes people of differing ranks and different origins and different locations, different languages. He brings them into Christ and they have one heart, and one soul, one mind. They're one body. They have one hope, one faith, one Lord. Amen. Yeah. But to do that, all right, now, see, once you see that, you see the absurdity of trying to go back to a system of law. Yeah, Brother Levine. That's, that's uh, kind of it sheds light on why Paul was so alarmed with the Galatians. That's right. That's you know, right. to yeah. the point where he even said, I'm afraid of you. That's right. Because, because of the magnitude of the fact that this was, this was slain, the enmity was slain, and it's by carnal nature is being brought. brought That's right. Back. Yeah, when you wake law up, it starts condemning. That's right. Yeah, that's what happens. By waking up, I mean you revert to it as a means to rectify the sin problem. Yeah. Anyone else have anything to say? This one, this one new man. That seems to be a, a pretty, in one way, I guess, a broad representation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I thought about uh, who shall declare his generation. Mm -hmm. Was that who shall declare his oh, generation? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. You're and, right. And also the prophecy of Isaiah nine of eternal Father. That's so right. This one new man is a is another way of saying the new the generation. That's right. Of Christ, the mm -hmm. new race. He didn't have a fleshly generation, right. but he did have a generation. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> yes, Sister Barb. I was also thinking about this the new environment. The wall of partition was between the two people groups, Jew and yeah. Gentile. But whenever Christ broke that down, he took that place That's between right. yep. the two groups. Yeah. And so that both then could flow into him, into him, into this new environment where he makes yeah. his Jew and Gentile both had need of becoming new. Yeah. And that's where they do is in the environment of Christ. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
All right, we'll have a word of prayer.